How many biscuits do you think is too many? Uh, two. Oh, well, uh, wait, hold on. Like biscuits with nothing on them or biscuits with like egg and ba- sausage or like biscuits with other stuff. Let's say there's a lot of um, protein and fat in between the biscuit. Two. I okay. I may have overdone it. How so many did you eat? Two. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have other stuff too? This is my first Bojangles run on this trip. Oh, the forbidden fruit. Cajun filet biscuits, which is just a slab of chicken to be, to, I mean, breaded and fried. That is the God tier Bojangles biscuit as far yeah, as I'm concerned. I mean, it's, it's the beginning. It's the alpha and omega of Bojangles. That's all you need to get there is a Cajun filet biscuit. I, you know, I'll, I'll get a steak biscuit occasionally. So wait, and a steak biscuit or, or a steak biscuit? That's an or for me, dog. Oh, okay. So yeah. So, okay. You, you got to pace yourself, man. You're there for a while. You, get, uh, you go a little bit one, a little bit two, right? Cajun filet biscuits, regular size bow rounds, which thankfully is reduced for my normal large size bow rounds. Well, okay. So it used to be that the large size bow rounds was like a sharing family size one. It was like a, uh, it came in a box that maybe some fried chicken could come in alternately. Really depends on your mindset. Let's say. <laughs> Fair. Today was a Cajun filet biscuit, a regular size bow rounds, and a steak, egg, and cheese biscuit. What'd you get to drink? Did you get a Diet Pepsi or something to wash that down? Uh, just coffee and water. Coffee and water. Okay. But, so oh. that that feels a bit like I've done that. I've I've mm-hmm. I've walked that forbidden path when mm-hmm. like I'm not going to be in range of a Bojangles again for a while. Like I'll I'll dip my toes in there. That was exactly my thinking. Was this is probably my one shot, and I've got to overdo it. Well, I mean, look, this is the benefit. Gina is a big fan of the Bojangles as well. Uh, so we will often do a split ski. And like one of us will get a steak and one of us will get a chicken and then okay. we each eat half and then trade. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's Which, responsible. Y- y- I mean, that helps. But then there's like, then there's like, where is it cut? Or are we just going to chew because we're in the car and then like hand it over and you got to like, you can you can get some you can get some feelings if you're not if if you're not generous with your with your split there i get yes i I get it but this used to be my standard order except like i said a large bow round instead i used to i used to take in my 20s a red eye out here because it was faster and cheaper i've done that it's horrible every time i would take the red eye i would land at 6 a.m in Uh charlotte my cousin would pick me up at the airport we would go straight to bojangles from the airport at 6 a.m after having not slept all day yeah, I would get I would get that whole sack of food I just described, and well, then we would go to his house and sit there and play video games all day on that stomach full of lead. Yeah, that's like a different um, a different scenario, right? Like that's a like when you're that's like that's like a drinking. I've been drinking Bojangles order. Mm-hmm, sure, you know, like yeah. uh, like maybe I went to the lake, had some afternoon beers, and I I need to like uh, you know put a little base on before I go back out again. I mean, like I said, this was more this was less drinking and more overnight flight, but you know. So, so here's my question though, is the Bojangles there? Cause there's two kinds of Bojangles is now, and, and this is a new development since I left Tennessee, but like there are nice Bojangles is now. Wait, what? Yeah. Like there are new, somebody, somebody in the last like 10, 15 years has expanded Bojangles dramatically. And there are like clean, new, not dank Bojangles. Mm, not so sure about. Look. Right. If it if it looks like uh, the the floor has been scrubbed more recently than like fifteen years ago, I'm not sure I want it. Yeah. The, so the ones that are best are the ones with like red tile, like dark red tile mm-hmm. floors. The tiles are like twelve inches, mm-hmm. and they've got black grout that probably used to not be black That's in between. Exactly. Them. Exactly it. You yeah. It. The so so my thing my thing is that I, the bow rounds are fine, but I'll go with the seasoned fries all day oh, long. Man. Oh my god! I need to like chug a trough of water after eating those, those oh, maybe the, oh yeah maybe those the are saltiest that might maybe the, the the saltiest food item on the planet they're so good dude they're so good they're so greasy they you pick one up and it just kind of sags real slow oh yes they're perfect if the if the little paper sack is not translucent yeah you're not eating bojangles it's, it's the dr nick rules to to weight gain uh, successful weight gain you can see through the bag on those things i i um i miss a bojangles i wish bojangles and waffle house are the two and and, and crystal like if we're talking about real garbage tier food like a crystal i'll go for a little southern white castle burger anytime uh, we, we don't have crystal around here i think Wait, like really I, I might have to i might have to take a pilgrimage across state lines it sounds like Oh man, yeah. So Crystal is like is like little tiny square steamed hamburgers. Oh, it's like literally White Castle. It's 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 a straight up White Castle knockoff, but they do chili. 
and like the secret is you get a cup of chili with the bergs and then you do a dunk on the bergs into the chili and that's pretty strong they also do a really good chicken like they do a chicken sando on like the little soft steam buns oh yeah it's a real crispy chicken with like mayonnaise and a pickle it's delish oh man do you remember chicken littles yeah that's a kfc thing isn't it they still do that do they st- are you serious yeah, uh, that, that's what that's what my wife likes when we if we if Wait, we ever what? taste the forbidden fruit of the of the kernel. I what chicken? Hang on. Oh, my God. Hang on. I'm going to go and tell you the Popeye's chicken sandwich that went massively viral in 2020 has done a really good thing for for if you like a fried chicken fast food sandwich. Oh, God, they are everywhere. Yeah, that Burger King one we had when we were on a road trip a few weeks ago is freaking incredible. It is a really spectacular chicken sandwich for like five bucks. Based on the indiscretions that occurred this morning, I should probably close this Google tab and start this podcast. Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad, full of biscuits and ready to podcast. I mean, I don't, I'd be asleep right now if I were you, man. I, it was a bad idea. It was a look, <laughs> trust me, it was, a, it was a bad idea. Also, after we're done here, I have to edit this podcast and then immediately go run around with small children for a while. So, so I was, uh, I played some Fortnite with a friend of the pod, Abby Russell, last night. Oh. And uh, we were talking about hot dogs and she was espousing her love of a chili cheese dog. And I had to break to her the news that the, there will come a time in your life when eating a chili cheese dog will cause, rather than joy, pain. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's it's a difficult calculation. Yeah, at some point, at some point, you really have to weigh the trade offs. Well, some some like I've learned that if you pre season with a little bit of tums, then mm-hmm. you can kind of you can do more damage. And oh man, and I discovered take- I something I discovered a South hack. Oh, on, okay. this, on this trip, just sweet tea on everything. No. <laughs> This sounds like this sounds like the most obvious thing in the world, but I've started I, I have started the beginning every day out here with a nice big bowl of oatmeal. Oh, yeah, that you get. Yeah, you're you're cushioning the system for what's about to land on it. It, it has helped dramatically. <laughs> you know, eating one thing that is not fried or drowning in grease every day is oh, really helping. Oh, my. Um. Yeah. So I. uh yeah yeah i i remember i just remember those old guys who would be sitting at like the barbecue place mm-hmm. with a swig of pepto-bismol or maalox and then mm-hmm. they'd eat some food and then they'd have a swig of pepto-bismol or some maalox like, Man, yeah yeah that back is the, not a way to live yeah back in the day around here they called it like uh well like biscuits and gravy for example the old timers would refer to as a stick to your ribs kind of breakfast my father called it that also. Yeah, right. But it's, but also all those people were working in the sawmill or out in the fields all day. Fair. So, like they, you know, they would always say like they burned it all off by lunchtime. Right. I mean, look, I sit behind this desk 18, 20 hours a day. Sometimes it's, <laughs> you know, those, you know what, it's like, what it's like to work in the sawmill, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just out in the Internet sawmills. Just, just sawing up mm, the pods. Yeah. Yeah. All uh, right. What are we doing here? Uh, well, OK, so. A few uh, last month, I believe we made an idle suggestion on the uh, the patron episode that since we both had play dates, maybe we should consider and like the the barrier to entry on making a play date game seemed relatively light. Yeah, we we idly suggested, hey, maybe we should make a play date game. Oh, you know, just a casual undertaking. I'm sure we could crank it out in a weekend. I don't I did not say that. That was what you said. And I said, I don't think that's the case. I'm joking. <laughs> but but you did say crank, which is good. Also, yes, I'm I'm I am both very excited by this idea and also extremely intimidated by it or more to the point intimidated uh, by committing to it publicly, because I don't know if we actually know what we're getting into here. Well, OK, so I have a pretty good idea of what we're getting into as I work at a game studio that makes real games. And mm-hmm. I am I have realized that. Uh, we should be very, we should limit our scope dramatically. Okay. Yes. Um, that sounds like a good step one. Well, and then the other thing I thought was we should do this in public. Uh, so yeah. like the plan is to do regular check-ins on the podcast. Um, but then also to like, when we're doing work on it, what, where it makes sense, 
maybe stream it in the Discord or you know where where people can watch and give suggestions and feedback and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, because I I feel like like playing Elden Ring, which I would not have finished had I not been streaming it on Twitch. Uh, I feel like we will have a better time of this if we can if we can get the help of of the the brilliant people in the TechPod audience to absolutely to help steer our path. Yes, there is no technical thing that they can't make easier. Or yes, hundred percent true. Or provide very useful advice on. Yeah. So, um, but it, like, also, it seems fun. Like, I the game that I work on for my job is a twenty person ordeal. I mean, not ordeal, but like, it's a it's a lot of work and it's a lot of moving pieces and it's a lot of people working together and. Like something as simple as changing the lighting on one level requires like four people to touch it at different points along the path. Right. I mean, yeah, it's it's a modern video game that works with a lot of sophisticated technology, right? Yeah. And there's mad dependencies. And this the, this is a tiny lightweight thing that is grayscale and has like extremely limited inputs. And yeah, dude, it's not even grayscale. It's just two colors. Oh, I guess grayscale implies different shades of gray. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Grayscale implies 256 bits worth of color. This, this is, is just one bit. It's either on or it's off. It's monochrome. Yeah. Uh, so um, although people do emulate grayscale by flashing the pixels on and off really fast, it seems oh, like no. from what I I've seen. I figure out how to do that. No, I don't. Look, keep the scope simple. OK, here, here is here is the extent of my experience with graphics coding ever. OK, uh, about this 30 minutes, about 30 minutes looking at a guide for writing an algorithm to output a dot ppm file you familiar with that image format dot ppm is the pixar thing no 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 it's a it is a it is an image file described in in ascii text oh wow like you can open up a ppm in a text editor and it's just text like it's and and also it was the algorithm did exactly one thing which was uh just a very smooth gradient image like literally just incrementing the color value of each pixel uh, in seventh grade, I wrote a program that you controlled a turtle on the screen and it walked okay. around and it made it painted behind it. Well, see, you've you've taken input and like drawn to the screen in some kind of real time. You've done more than I have 35 years ago. So mm. what, did, what, what was, was that? What was that? In? Basic. Like, was that basic? We did basic. Okay. A lot of a lot of for loops, as I recall. Interesting. I, I we did Pascal in middle school. Look, I did. I did a lot of if. If then jumps that would just loop back on each other in ways that were completely unpredictable. So it wasn't good. Uh, Mistakes were made. Yes. Sounds like a lot of video games. Um, so why are we? So, OK, so we're doing this because it seems like it would be fun. We yeah. might learn something. Yes. Hopefully. Yes. We we like making something fun seems good or maybe I, making something not fun and then learning how to make it fun is even more useful. I, I don't know if this speaks to where I'm at in my life, but I frequently now feel that making things is more satisfying and entertaining than consuming them i mean look uh coming from tested i can tell you that making things is very satisfying like that i mean like that playdate cover you've been working on yeah just to stay on topic here i guess like that I, that looks i mean a you've done like a really fantastic job with the, the product but i'm sure that's like immensely satisfying to dial yeah. that thing in and get it as like precise <laughs> I, I took it camping last weekend and showed it to one of the other dads who works in like the the studio arts and he, I, I, I handed it to him, let him click it on. That's like a sad. That's a that's a good. It just makes such a good clicking sound when you put it on. That's almost um, like that's almost like a product trailer worthy click. But I learned something important there, uh, which is that the magnet in the lower right corner, I think, is interfering with the Hall effect sensor that tells when the switch when the crank is in or out. Oh no! And it's running the battery down. So I gotta, oh, I gotta, no. I gotta. I think I can just take that bat that magnet off, and it'll be fine. See, when you're making stuff, this is the stuff people don't understand, whether you're making podcasts or a website or videos or a Playdate cover. Yeah. I mean, the, the range of things that can come up unexpectedly that take time and, and effort to solve is functionally infinite. Well, that's it. And and here's the other thing is that you you have made stuff for a really long time, but like you had the same problem that I have where like when, when I was working on Tested or working on the magazine or whatever, the stuff we make is kind of ephemeral. And, yes. and while it hangs around, it's not like it doesn't continue to be relevant no. in a way that like, I don't know, writing a book does or something. Yeah. It feels like, yeah, and I, by I, extension, I, have maker, but, I have maker envy. I've always yes. been jealous of people who make things that last. Yes, absolutely. And, and by extension, the stuff that we made doesn't tend to get preserved very well. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff is just gone. Now, I remain glad that I uploaded the archive of Maximum PC to archive.org. Yeah, I should 
archive some of my stuff too. Yeah. I mean, you have a place for it. It's true. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and, and you wanted to learn how to code. Yeah. Like this is C is C plus plus is what we use for this. I think, uh, C oh, or Lua. Oh. I mean, I, I, we would almost certainly be using Lua. I've written one semester's worth of C. I assume we Actually, start I'm with no, no, we, I'm sorry. We, we did C plus plus in that college course. I took. Oh, see, I did C in my college course, but that was um, also 25 years ago. So, I mean, I'm like, I, I could probably get up to speed on writing C if I really needed to, but it would be a lot of effort. But, but like the interesting thing for me is I've not really worked in like the f- confines of an SDK, but bef- like, like there's an interesting framework that th- this kind of device with a limited number of inputs and outputs and like a pretty well-defined SDK and, and easy to use tools gives that is like, you know, it's like jaws, right? The, the robot shark sucking added constraints to that film that made the film much better. So we're hopeful <laughs> that the constraints of this tiny kind of low power indie game handheld will uh, add genius to our otherwise tepid uh, first d- dips into game building. So, yeah, the, the documentation that they provide for the um, development tools is quite robust from what I've seen. It's freaking incredible. Yeah, like, they're, they're, trust panic, man. They, yeah. they they documented the hell out of this thing. So so there's some stuff I need to go back and dig up that they did. Like one of their developers did. It's God, I bet it's been like two years now because this thing, you know, obviously got delayed a couple times. It shipped a couple years late. Yeah. Uh, one of their one of their programmers was streaming himself, making a very simple game for this thing a couple years ago and straight up starting from nothing and showing how to take input and like how to draw yep. a box to the screen and then how to marry the input to the box to move it around on the screen and all that stuff. And like, I, I'm sure that stuff would be very instructive. The thing I want to avoid is just looking at that and copying everything, except I bet a lot of working developers would. Well, that's kind of how it works. Starting out is just copying what other people do until you understand how it works. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny you say that. I forgot because I did a bunch of Arduino stuff when I was at Tested, like a ton, which is all C. Um, and and like there was something incredibly satisfying about writing a little piece of code, writing it over to the hardware, plugging the hardware into the into the board that you'd built and then pressing a button and watching a light turn on. Like so the simplest thing when you can when you. There's something about making something that has a physical interaction and and like the the possibility space of, hey, there's two buttons and a D-pad and a crank. And so and it has a speaker and a screen is constrained in a way that makes it, I think, easier to approach than like, hey, we can do anything. You Like when, when I look at my PC, I'm like, yeah, I could write code for this, but I could do anything. I could do anything from making like, you know. Uh, death stranding all the way down to you know uh, the cd uh library app that i built for my cs 100 class that everybody did that sucked um so okay so so that's where yeah, we're it, at uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's that immediate feedback it's it's the it's rigging some stuff up and then like hitting a button and making it do exactly what you wanted it to do yeah just copying the rom over and plugging it into the thing and loading it up and seeing how it works Yes. Also a kind of a corollary to what we're talking about here. I've, I've said in a few episodes ago, I said like my greatest joy in life is to set up a job on a computer and then like hit a button and watch it go. Yeah. Like, like writing some code and then running it or compiling it or whatever is the ultimate expression of that. Right. So like I'd kind of, I, and this is a good pathway in. Yeah. You know, like sometimes I feel like learning to do a thing is not the hard part. It's learning. How can I put this? Like Figuring out what you want to do is what's hard. Once you know exactly what you want to do, then you can set about doing it, right? Well, you, but I like, mean, I like think I'm, that's, that's definitely I'm, the case. Like, I, I know I want to write, get better at writing code, but I need, like, an objective. I need something to focus my efforts toward, right? Well, and it, this seems like a good version of that. It's also nice to have somebody to kind of nudge you. Because, yeah. like, uh, if you do this on your own, then often, like, you'll stall out and stop doing it and other stuff will distract you. Right. And when we even, we even just spitballed about this, like you said, on the... Uh, patron episode already a bunch of people on the discord like when i when i said like oh I'd, i have our time envisioning like how you manage state and update state and like what the loop looks like yeah internally uh in a simple game and like people immediately got in touch and were like hey here's some like pseudo code that kind of explains a version of how you would do that so like yeah it's, it's exciting to like have a purpose and then once we have that maybe people can can chime in yeah so um so then uh the other thing is the big thing that I've learned from working in real in in you know professional games is that you the loop that we use at Stray Bombay that's worked pretty well is to get things into the game as quickly as possible and then test them internally and also externally 
see what people think, and then iterate based on that feedback and just yeah. keep doing that over and over again until you get to something that's fun. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. For people who don't know, the play date is a little like, I don't know, it's like the size of like a credit card and a half. It's 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 yeah. a tiny little game console. It's kind of like it, a big drink coaster. Y- yeah. It has a D-pad. It has a couple of face buttons. It has a crank. Uh, it has yeah. an accelerometer. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah, you can um, see it. I, I knew that from if there's an input test on there. And if you go in there, you can see it reading position. But it oh. sounds like that might not be exposed mm. by the API. So I found it. I found it in the SDK. Uh, okay. You have to turn it on. They turn it off by default to save power. Oh. Yeah. So that's one of the interesting things about this thing is that it seems like it runs in as simple a mode as possible at all times to because it's tiny and does not have a big battery. Well, and it's pretty low power, too. So right. like the Wi-Fi is not active at all times, for example. Right. Yeah, the Wi-Fi is not active all times. It's um the the storage is relatively limited. It's only like three or four gigs total. Yeah. Um, so like they recommend, I think 150 megs is the is is a big game for this. Yeah. So yeah. we're not gonna yeah, have to so, build a ton of art, which is nice. Yeah. Um, so so basic D pad, two face buttons, the crank. Yep. Which is basically uh, a one axis analog uh analog input with infinite endpoints. Right. right. Uh the accelerometer and then you said there is a mic input on the headphone jack yeah i don't know that that's it. i couldn't find anything about accessing that in the sdk okay um i also i i also assume with the rule of game peripherals that if you start trying to use that then you're going to cut your audience size down pretty dramatically so yes yes uh, for sure. i'm going to say <laughs> probably we're not prepared to do audio processing so i think we should forget that there's a mic input on the headphone jack yes um, also the idea of this game having an audience is charming <laughs> and quaint to well, me Look, Gina will play it, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> sure. Um, Significant others will be very excited. Yeah. Uh, so that that's what we have to that's what we have to work with. Um like it's it's surprisingly responsive is the from like playing the twitchy games that are available on it. It's it is it is I was expecting it to be a little chonky and slow, and it is absolutely not that. Like the yeah. like the surfing game that's one of the week one games is super super sensitive to to analog input and you can go pretty much as fast as you want yeah but, like like i started to say too sensitive which is more critical than i mean but it's very easy to overshoot in that game it's mm-hmm. very easy to over crank yeah you don't want to crank too hard okay uh, so maybe you don't uh should we anything i like i'm i'm super interested in the crank obviously yeah it's definitely the one differentiator otherwise this thing is kind of a glorified game boy right yeah with a sideways screen instead of a vertical screen right right um right also I, just since we were talking about kind of input and tech stuff what we've got to work with i think that screen tops out at 50 hertz is that right it's 50 hertz and um which is pretty it's nice and smooth for it, um, it, but it is literally two colors yeah 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 for it's sure. either on just or mean off. more like like to just add to what you said about responsiveness like it, it is a pretty smooth experience for for twitchy arcade games which is i, I feel like that's Something extremely simple and action based is probably which direction we're going to go first. That feels right to me. Uh, can I ask a question real quick? Yeah, of course. Like totally tangential because because 50 hertz is kind of a strange number. I, I assume it like this is a specific Samsung or Sharp. Who makes this panel? I do you remember. I didn't. I didn't look. Actually, I keep beforehand. forgetting. I keep forgetting, but it's like it's kind of a well-known display. I don't know if that 50 hertz number is like unique to this panel or whatever, but there's been this big movement toward 40 frames per second modes in games. Do you have any insight into that? Like, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the basics. Huh, it's something I, about it's something about even consistent frame time. Like it's kind of like perceptually it is way smoother than 30, even though it's not that different in terms of number of frames per second. Is it about motion smoothing? Because a, lo- a lot of that is putting... Um, one of the things that people are doing when they have lower perf games these days is turning on motion blur and doing a higher quality motion blur, which is relatively inexpensive. There, there may be some motion blur involved, like the 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 use case, the practical use case in, in console games that I've been seeing, like like Ratchet and Clank on the PS5 did this and they just announced that Horizon, uh, the new Horizon Forbidden West, they're also going to add a 40 FPS mode. It's for like 4K modes. It's essentially like, huh. you know, the performance needs at 40 are not that much higher than at 30, so they can like make some very minor adjustments to steadily hit 40 but that it is is dramatically smoother in practice i haven't seen it in person i just i wonder what the math is there my, my assumption is that it's just um it's just easier to hit you know it's it's 20 30 percent less than 60 right well i mean so, more in terms of what's going on with the brain or the eyes that makes 
Because oh. again, like on paper, 40 doesn't seem like it would be that much smoother than 30, but apparently like it's a night and day difference according to a lot of people who use it. So my my assumption from doing VR stuff and doing a lot of like hands-on demos and testing with people is that ability to perceive frame rate is probably, I, and I don't know that there's any science at all in this. I'm, I'm literally talking out of out of my ass about my observed experience in life. Um, my assumption is that there's a spectrum that starts with not able to perceive differences in frame rate and ends up with very sensitive to perceived frame rate and that the fat part of the curve ends before you get to 40 frames per second. Hmm, interesting. So like, for example, at Maximum PC, uh, there was a, the hardware editor at PC Gamer, Greg Viederman, was able to look at a thing and be like, oh, yeah, that's running about 35 frames a second. And he was fucking right every time. <laughs> Um, but he was, he was very sensitive to frame rates compared to everybody else that was in that relatively small sample size. And like, given, given the people, the different ways that people were sensitive to VR and the range of sensitivity, like, like, for example, uh, my, uh, Gina, my partner can do, can, can do like 10, 15 minutes of VR, but that's it. No matter what, no matter what frame rate you're running, it doesn't matter. She's good for like 15 minutes at the absolute high end. And like, I know I, I had several other people that did demos that just started feeling motion sick after that. And, and, um, that would be massively with Gina, especially it's massively accelerated if the frame rate's low. So like, if you were seeing even like, like, like I would see a sag on the, on the frame rate meter and steam VR and she would be like, did something just happen? I feel bad. Whoa. And it was like literally two frames being, being below the six milliseconds or whatever it was. Huh. So so my guess is that there's a perception and that's, that's yeah. where you get into the good part of the bell curve. Interesting. I'm going to have to yeah. do some more reading on that. Yeah. I, I bet that somebody's done cognitive research. I, I have a friend who does, um, I cogn cognitive science around eye and vision that we can ask about that if we want. Maybe that would be, that would be actually a fantastic episode sometime. Yeah. Um, but back to the topic at hand. Yes. One real quick before we move on to the next section, the one the one thing I omitted in terms of like tools we have to work with, there's a there's a home or menu button. It's yeah. a menu button. It's not a home button because it pops out. It's almost like in the Xbox dashboard kind of pops it's out like from a the, the screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a blade, but you can you can put a uh, game per game unique uh, setting categories in there. Right. Like yeah. You can pop that out and tweak the game with different stuff. Yep. There are many, many. It is a fully extensible console platform. Yes, indeed. All right, okay. so what so are we going to make? Yeah, our homework was to come up with a few ideas. Mm -hmm. um, my The first thing I saw when I started doing the crank was that I wanted to make a Galaga or Space Invaders kind of game. Yeah, but, I, I think like, classic, a classic arcade action game or a variation on that or something in that vein is absolutely the natural place to start. Yeah, I think I think starting with an arcade game is a good idea because like doing something that's big and story driven is going to involve a lot of time and... Like, I think it's better to do something that we can iterate on and fail fast if it's going to be bad. Yeah. Also, like I, I think about uh, or asteroids, I think, is another example. And although there, there are a <laughs> there lot are least, of those, at yeah. least two or three asteroid style games already for this thing. I'm not saying we would do that, but like even even from my layperson's perspective. Uh, looking at, like, say, the acceleration and deceleration of the ship and asteroids, for example, I can at least like pseudo code kind of imagine how you would kind of iterate your way through yeah. phys physics like that and stuff like that. Like that seems like something that is approachable. Well, so, but here's the thing about the space invaders or Galaga game that I think is fun because like I, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm interested in the crank. I want mm -hmm. to either adjust time with the crank and go forwards and backwards. Yes. Or alternately make the crank control a chain gun and just make the Galaga <laughs> shoot ship shoot fucking crazy fast. Just so, like, bah, 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 bah. So I don't think it's available anymore, but in the pre-release SDK, I think it's no longer compatible with the shipping unit, but somebody oh. ported actual Doom to this thing. Oh, and that's exactly how the chain gun in their port of Doom worked is that you had to oh. crank, crank to spin up and shoot the chain gun, which is yeah. moi. That sounds but, so uh, good. But um, yeah, the uh, the name keeps escaping me, but the but the side scrolling robot puzzle game, which I think is like kind of the flagship game. Or Franklin's it's, it's Time Adventure. Used, what is it? Franklin's time adventure. Yes. Yes. That's the one. Is that the, I think, is that the Bennett Foddy one or is that the, no, he made a different, he, he made that isometric samurai action or strategy game. I can't remember the name. Oh, of this, it. uh, the Franklin is the, is the, uh, um, well, I'm looking, I think it's the, it's the, uh, I think Keita Takahashi Takahashi game. Did he maybe. make that? Oh, 
at any rate, they I think they used it to show off the play date early on quite a bit. Like it was one of their key marketing. The reason is because it uses the crank for time travel in a really clever way. Yeah. And it's like, Crankins, and, not Cranklins. Sorry. Crank, I, yes. Right. The font is uh, hard to read. I think that's probably my favorite use of the crank on that thing. Like it's got a really tactile feel because you literally are fast forward and, and rewinding this robot through his routine. It, you know, it really hands on kind of way, you know, you move a crank and he moves with it. Like it's, well, it's really satisfying. And it ends up, have you beaten it yet? No, it ends How up long. Is it like it? it I, I haven't gotten to the end yet. I've, I'm okay. like, I like I, I'm probably on like the 15th level or something. 10th. Oh, level. wow. OK. It seems like I've I been think it, for a long time. Yeah, I think I got six or seven days in. It's it, it's a little repetitive. It's kind of each puzzle really builds on the last one. So you're kind of re- repeating a lot of the same actions, but it's really clever. It get it gets surprisingly it gets real puzzly by the end. Like it's yeah. it, it becomes a like a, a anyway, it's it's a it's a really neat like clearly it has been they've spent a lot of time working on it, but it's it's really neat. Um, but yeah, so, so, but my thought is Galaga or Space Invaders probably, so the animation burden is a little bit lower, plus massive number of bullets, chain gun, seems like it would be fun with some like that stupid power ups where you can do like V's or, or like a laser that gets wider, the more you crank it's you know, stuff like that. Like, like there's a space, there's space in the weapons there that seems like it would be fun to noodle with. See, all I can think about here is like, how do you handle collision and bounding boxes on like your the player character and a power up, for example? Like, I'm trying to think like the mechanics of, you know, if detecting, X, detecting when one intercepts the other. Yes. X, like, Y. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Look, that, I'm, I'm just art and design. That's <laughs> a programming problem. Crap. Uh, okay. So that, that's my first one is, is cranking, cranking invaders. Yeah, I, I the first one I wrote down here, I stole straight from the Discord. Apologies to whoever actually thought of it, but it's too good not to uh, a crank based idle game. Ooh, although although that doesn't sound that idle. Is that a contradiction in terms? Yeah, there's something oxymoronic about that. Do you have to crank to eat the cookie? Uh, maybe. I'm well, sh- hmm. What okay. if it's, what if it's just a, a fishing thing? What's a competing term for idle game that does not apply idleness, but. I, I, I don't, I stopped playing them because they, it turns out they're bad for my brain. They make yeah. me kind of sad. What was the last one I played? Paper Clips was the last one I played probably. What was the, I don't think it was Cookie Clicker, but there was a web, there was a web-based like ASCII text based one. That's the Paperclip one, isn't it? 2012, 2013. No, it was something about a candy store. It was not Cookie Clicker. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I played so much of it. What is it called? Yeah, we played it in the. It was when we were still in the basement. We played it in yes, the basement. It was right around. We were all it was talking right, about it. It was right before Whiskey Media got split up. Um, gosh, it was the one I right hope before somebody, the paperclip one. That sounds right. I hope somebody writes in. I was fascinated by that thing. That was a very good. One of those. Um, um, I'm into that. There's a, there's like a there's like a text adventuriness to that that's kind of appealing. Yeah, although that's less um, that's less hands on and action based. Like I. I do like the idea of just figuring out how to move a character around the screen. And this would not really be that this is a little bit more. That would be more of like a spreadsheet kind of game. Yeah. But I mean, I, I think there's an argument that those kinds of games are interesting when you add other things on top, like, like the roguelike, there's an opportunity to expand upon the core idle characteristics with other mechanics and mash them together in ways that are weird and interesting for sure. Um, And, And the pockety nature of this is, is a cool, like, there's an opportunity like it's surprising to me. I mean, I know Animal Crossing has had mobile versions, but it's surprising to me that there's not more phone games that are like, hey, you should play this for five minutes a day and some cool shit will happen. And then you move on to the next day. Sure. I I, I do. It does occur to me as we talk through this that I wonder if we should be careful about getting too far out over our skis on the design and idea part, because the implementation is going to be such a challenge that even even pulling off a like incredibly well-worn rip off of an idea is going to be tough for us. So I wonder if maybe we should, we should constrain the conceptual part. So what I would say is once we decide which concept we're going to do, we should, we should MVP it and get to the bare minimum version of that. So like if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's it's space invaders, we have one enemy, every third one shoots down one enemy that moves down the screen and you shoot up at it. And then we build that and then we see what we do next. Right. Like it's your, 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 you're making a layer cake here. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, the, uh, so like for the idle game, it would be, 
something happens when you crank and then you have to crank and and add things that scale exponentially i guess right. i don't know something happens something like a different and possibly reverse happens when you crank the other way yeah yeah I, in my head that game lives and dies based on how well like how much of a um so one of the designers at work ryan um uh d- describes things like that as a toy so like it's like the little they're not really it's not really like the game thing, but it's like it's like the fast reload in gears, right? It's like a thing that you do while you're playing the game that like makes you hits you hits you with a little bit of dopamine. Oh yeah, so you feel good when you land it, right? Oh, the the active reload to this day is just yeah, incredibly satisfying. So to like all. whatever the toy is of the cranking, like in Cookie Clicker, it's the feeling you get when you click and the numbers go up, right? Like, like cookie clicker is a weird example because it's kind of like a dark pattern for dopamine because it gives you <laughs> uh-huh. dopamine for doing things that are really unhealthy and bad for you ultimately. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um. Anyway. So, so I think, I think that one lives or dies based on how we do with the, well, like what the crank does. Yeah. yeah um, I think, I think you're right. I, I wanted, I had like a trampoline stunt game that's like mm. a top down. So you're looking down from the tread, the trampoline on the top and you use the D pad to move around and you tap a to bounce and then you crank to do flips and stuff. And like, you know, it's like a stunt game with scores. I don't know. So it's like, it's like Tony Hawk, but trampolines. Yeah, exactly. Not the, that's not the worst idea. I mean, that's like, even whether we make it or not, like somebody should make that. I think the animation's pretty easy for that because hmm. it's just the same animations. They just get bigger or smaller based on how high you're jumping. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so like hopefully hopefully there is some library in there for st- easy sprite scaling or something i don't know yeah of course um but i i like i i just want i want like wild sp- on that one i think i want wild spinning and like horrific bodily injury when it goes bad okay yeah not bad, not bad. okay I, I feel like that one didn't land so so somebody else can take that one at this point mm, that's you know maybe we'll maybe we'll just have a server-wide game jam going on i would love that that would be amazing the other thing is there is an emulator. So even if you can't get a play date right now, you can download the SDK, which has the emulator yes. and try them and see what your, see how your stuff works. In fact, I think we mentioned it before. Like they caution you. It's going to run better when you run that thing. Yeah. It's going to run better on here than it does on the actual hardware. So be careful, but yeah, well, you know, uh, so be uh, it. Um, I, I wrote down a variation on snake. Okay. And then I remembered that one of the season one games is exactly that. And in fact, I believe it's made by a pretty well-known designer. I can't remember who. There are some itch snake clones as well for it as well. That might be Zach Gage's game. Oh, that would, that, that seems like a very, that seems like a very, Zach, Zach Gage's, uh, Zach Gage, if you don't know, he did Spell Tower and, um, uh, not, he just released not words a few months ago. Yeah. That, yeah. We've Alex has been playing a lot of not words. Um, my brain is bad for not words. It turns out. Um, but the other one he did is flip note, I think. No, uh, uh he did flip pop solitaire, which is fantastic. Uh, good, good Sudoku. Good Sudoku is really good. I play that a lot. And then there's, um, um the Tharsis or Tarsus and Thar- type shift. Type shift is the other one. That's incredible. Played a lot of games. Yeah. Tharsis is, is neat too. Uh, snack. It is. It is Zach Age. He he made a snake game called Snack for season one. So is it S N A K? Yes, I love it. Uh, I I didn't play a ton of it, but from what I could tell, the only change is that you can jump over yourself. You can jump. Oh, like you can the, the head can jump, and then you can like kind of avoid yourself and avoid. Ob- In fact, I think there are there are some kind of enemies that you have to jump over to neutralize. That's a pretty significant upgrade. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty tough, challenging complicated snake but I, I, don't, I don't know that we can just make another snake but that seems like a game that you could program <gasps> Ooh. i mean we could make Hang a on. minesweeper can we make a minesweeper where the cranking matters where you like have... defuse the mines if you fuck up okay in the vein of free games included with microsoft operating systems i have a better idea okay can i add this to the list i just thought put of ski free at the bottom oh better a ski free is pretty port, good dude what if we port or make a clone of gorilla.bass the thing that's in excel Wait, did they ever put that in it? Hang on. I don't know what Gorilla.bass is, I don't think. Wait, really? Yeah. Shipped with, uh, I actually looked this up recently. I want to say the first version of DOS that Gorilla came with. Yeah, DOS 5. MS-DOS 5 was the first version of DOS to ship with Gorilla.bass. I don't know what Gorilla.bass is. Have you played Worms? I don't like Worms. Hmm. Okay, we may have a problem here then. Gorilla Gorilla is kind of, it's a two-player Worms-ish type game. Except your gorillas on top of skyscrapers throwing explosive bananas at each other. 
Wow, really? I bet you, you How did I use never the find out about this? Oh my god, you should. I bet it would not be that hard to. I bet. I bet there is a web based version of Gorilla Hub. Ass I mean, I have a Mister with a four eighty six core running DOS five right uh, here. Probably you could. You could be playing Gorilla in seconds. Um, you could. You could do some interesting stuff with like the crank to line up the trajectory or to kind of determine Ooh. the strength of your throw. Or both. What about a slingshot or catapult game where you hmm. use the crank to wind it? Okay. And then aim and release. Okay. I, I like I like the idea of using the crank for something that is not just duration, but also speed or intensity. Like Oh, I like that. Okay. That that's not it's not just a fixed uh like drawback speed, regardless of how fast you're doing it, that maybe it's something I don't, like, I don't know what the like, physical metaphor would be there. Huh. Like like you're charging something up, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, like it's not it's not just you need to do it for a certain amount of time, but also like <laughs> harder and faster. There's a there's an idea. There's an idea that like everybody you hand that thing and they look at it and they're like, oh, it has a crank. Oh, is it to charge it? And you're like, no, it's not to charge. Yeah. it. It's literally yeah. the first thing everybody asks. So what if the crank charged the gun <laughs> in the game? OK, yeah. what if you like you had to crank it up really hard. And it, it, it was it was like it's like the Futurama episode with the with with the Scooty Puff blaster. And he has to <laughs> he has to crank it to charge up the gun and then he shoots one shot and then he cranks it again. OK, I got another idea. OK, we can go even simpler here. What if we just give everybody what they want and allow them to charge a fake battery with the crank? Oh, that now that that is a <laughs> really a, good V1. Let's just make, make a nice full screen, nicely styled battery meter that you can charge back up with the crank because you can't do it with the actual hardware. That that seems like a perfect. Hey, let's learn how to use the SDK and make something that actually runs. We should do that. OK, we should we should do that and put it on itch and then retire billions actually- of dollars. <laughs> this is this joking. is the beginning of Brad Will Soft. But like, actually, you know, what's weird. Uh, do you remember I beer? Yeah. People made billions the, of dollars with that stupid thing. The guy who made I beer did an AMA on Reddit uh, like some weeks or months ago. I forget how re- pretty recently. When was the I last time I he worked? I don't think he. it was tough to tell. I mean, obviously, like people actually, I saw like the, the, the Plague Inc. guy also just did an AMA recently. And like, unsurprisingly, people in that position don't exactly want to answer the uh, numerous questions about how much money they've made. Well, but play Inc. is a real thing. A oh, play Inc. is huge, but like, like it's a real game. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean that that guy's running a studio with like twelve employees. Like that is yeah. clearly doing quite well. But the I beer guy reading between the lines, it did. He didn't sound like he made an absolute fortune and is like filthy rich and retired now. But he could be. I mean, I I would bet he got enough to pay to get a real good down payment on a really nice house. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think he's doing just fine. But yeah. he did make allusions to like he's still he's still working on some stuff. It's just not clear if he's doing it for fun or not. But anyway, the reason I bring up iBeer is that he kind of talked about that same thing I'm thinking about with his battery meter, right? Of like, here's just a fun, tactile little thing that people kind of wish they could do. Well, granted, I don't think anybody expected to pour real beer out of their iPhone. It's not quite the same thing. But you Maybe. know what I mean? Like, it's just a it's a toy. Like you said, it's a trinket. Yeah. It's just a fun, novel use of this thing that kind of goes to a like a desire to use it in a way that you didn't know you had. Can I take, can I take two of our ideas and jam them together here? What do you, yeah, what do you got? Okay. So your fake battery charged with the crank Mm -hmm. is an idle game. Yeah. Okay. And it's, and it's like a check in every day idle game. Yeah. Where you charge up the battery and then some stuff happens on like day three. Maybe, maybe there are some ever increasing demands on the battery. Yeah. And also a tech tree that you have to climb down that incre- that adds yeah. the ability to generate electricity, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, using the accelerometer instead of the sure. crank. So you okay. can just, There's you a, know, a, a high capacity battery upgrade. Yeah, exactly. Um, There's a tree. Okay. Um, okay. We have a few more ideas. Do we want to save them or do we want to keep going? No, let's no, let's, let's throw them out there. Okay. Um, I, I'm surprised that there's not a lock picking game. Oh, that yeah. Does, like the classic, like, I mean, there's no there's no vibration in it, but you might be able to simulate that with the speaker making noise. Yeah, I bet you could. And like, there's no it seems like you'd be able to do like either a, a, a safe cracking or a lock picking or something that's really satisfying and fun. Yes, for sure. That sounds good. Um, also, also, I feel like there is room for disruption in the lock picking minigame space. Yeah, I feel like see. it's been a while since we saw like a truly novel like uh, what was it? Um, I think it was Dying Light 2 a few months ago came out and literally just had the Elder Scrolls lockpicking minigame. <laughs> I'm like, really? Well, well and Skyrim then, itself, not let alone the earlier ones, was over a decade ago. And we're still 
doing this exact same lock picking. Yeah, and then Sniper Elite 5 just came out, and there's not even a game. You just press and hold E, mm-hmm. which makes yep. me kind of sad. Um, oh, lock, lock picking game could be cool. Yeah, like, I, what was it? Was it Splinter Cell that came out with the lock picking game in the first time? And you're like, oh, this is incredible. I mean, the, so the other thing you could do is do like a code code breaking thing where you have like dials and you're turning the crank to adjust the dials to different numbers. And like, there, like there's a there's multiple games in this in this subgenre, I think. Oh, wow, dude. Like, man, World War Two era cryptographer game for the play. <laughs> it's like a game I didn't know I wanted. Yeah. Like, can we can we make a Bletchley Park game for the play date? I mean, look, we, we can make it. It can be an asynchronous multiplayer game where one person uh-huh. is programming Colossus and the other person is a submarine commander. And uh-huh. uh, yeah. Uh, and then, and then some, the, someone captures the Enigma machine halfway through. and Exactly. And you're like, hey, all of a sudden our submarines keep sinking out of the blue. What's happening? This is weird. <laughs> hmm. Let's see here. Uh, I wrote down a not a game game. Like I like somebody this made idea. That. Yeah, I don't know what it would be exactly. Like the probably my favorite thing for the play date so far is somebody made a we streamed it on Nextlander. Oh god, what is it called? It takes the animation files from Flipnote Studio for the 3DS uh-huh. and just lets you play them with the crank. That's amazing. And it's not a game, but it's like an art studio project kind of thing. It's just a player, but it's serving such a cool like preservationist kind of role. I like the idea of making an animation player that lets you, you know, show the last like that lets you do like flip animation basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly what that was like. Something in that vein would be cool, but I don't know what, um, I, I wrote down crank the unofficial game of the movie. <laughs> okay. And I, I assume it's just like you electrocuting Jason Statham, but I don't know exactly what that is. It's, you uh-huh. know, I, I figure there's just like a crude representation of Statham, Statham's face and you have to crank really hard to to zap him every two minutes or he dies. Uh-huh. Yes. You know, where does, where does Amy Smart fit into this whole thing? I don't know. Look, this she, is, every once in a while she comes up and is like, and she like, if you, if you, if you are not able to crank hard enough, she'll come in and occasionally like throw some acid on you or something. I don't Ooh, know. Boy, well, 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 nice. well, you know, look, those movies are a little thin. I don't, I don't know if you mm. remember, but yeah, fair. Um, I I really enjoy the what you've written after this. Which one? Text. Did you? I don't. You didn't oh, say I wrote this, this one a minute yet. ago. Yeah. Text adventure plus crank. <laughs> yeah, but like text that is so self evidently absurd that I I can't help but enjoy it. But like, so I don't know what the plus crank means here, right? Like, is it is it is it like a you can flip through the pages like 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 it's like a it's like you're doing the thing with the choose your own adventure book where you have your fingers in five different places throughout the book so you can go back. Oh, I, you know what? I, I think the, the, the option here that is a good vehicle for comedy is to format it just like it's Zork or whatever. Yeah. You know, just text scroll with a parser at the bottom, but don't let you actually type anything. Just pre-write all the stuff and the crank scrolls through the possible. Oh, that's really good. Inputs and like every scenario has like 10 of them and they're all dumb. Like when it, you know, somebody who is funnier than me, like an Eric Walpaw could do something really funny with a a pre-written text adventure that you pick your way through. Or what if it's like a, what if it's like a hacking, like a cyberpunk kind of hacking, like a tense hacker versus hacker thing where you're just one side of it. Instead of having to type the stuff in on the computer, you just crank it and it, and it like, it's like coming out of the cadence Ooh. of what you're typing. Yeah. Actually like a hacking game would be really some kind of hacking mini game kind of thing here. Could also be very cool. Um, like I, I just see you turning the crank to make the the text type, and that that right. feels yes. very satisfying to me. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, some ideas here. I I think look, I think we have a clear V one with the with the charge of the fake the fake battery with the crank. Yeah, I I guess I think we should just set about making the very simple version of that. <laughs> Get it on itch as fast as possible. I think I there's think, a need. I think there's once, a need in the market. Yeah, I think once we have that in place. We can choose to either expand it and like go in the idle game direction with that or maybe make that like maybe hook it onto a text adventure and like make charging the battery for your for your hacking deck part of the the thing you have to do before you start. And then like once you your charge runs out, you're done for the day. Right. Like, yeah, I don't know. There's there's stuff around that. Yeah, I, I think that is a pretty solid winner of an idea. It, it does, however, not fulfill my desire to move a character around the screen. Well, look, I think phase one start simple phase two Mm -hmm. move a character around a screen okay um i mean look if you the other one i would totally go down is the is the space invaders with the crank machine gun because i feel like the crank machine gun is an underserved market right now 
Yeah, my, oh, let's see, I'm, I'm thinking manually, in terms of manual dexterity there. So you'd be moving left and right with the D-pad and, cr- and shooting with the crank? All the shooting is with the crank. Do you think, would that be tough to, would it be tough to move left and right? Would you be unbalancing the unit by cranking it a lot? Would that be tough? I guess you could try that right now. I have been practicing. Are there are there any games that you've seen that Not, use the D-pad and the crank at the same time? Yeah, um, there are definitely some games that use the D-pad and the crank at the same time. It is unusual. Okay. But like it, it does. It doesn't seem destabilizing. And so the other thing I was thinking is that you could do like forwards crank shoots the bullets and backwards goes back in time. Ooh, because I haven't okay. seen a whole lot of like this. This might be the the second iteration game rather than the like. This seems like it's more complicated. Yeah, because if you're going back in time, you have to keep memory. You have to keep the game state in memory, and there's a yes. there's a bunch of nonsense that goes with that. Or that it has to tough. be deterministic, so you can just roll backwards a frame, right. which is which is another level of challenge. Um, so I don't know. You, you know what I'm realizing here? Pretty easy to think of ideas. Executing on them is perhaps going to be a different story. Well, I mean, this is, this is, this is why we start with the simple one, right? It's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good place. I think this is a good place to kind of like, I would love to hear what people think. You can post in the, yeah. this week's channel in the discord. You can send an email to techpod at content.town. Um, you can hit us on Twitter if you want it. Will Smith or at Brad Shoemaker. Yeah, for sure. Let us know if we're having delusions of grandeur here or if you have any advice or or which ideas you like, which ones are you think are which ones, you know, if you, hey, you have a play date, which ones would you like to play? Let us know. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, anything you want to take part in tips, tricks. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't know when I guess no, no timeline for like producing any work on this just yet. I, th- I I mean, look, I'm I'm ready to go right now. I blocked out the whole weekend. I'm just going to jam <laughs> out a uh, battery gauge. You've got nothing else going on, right? I'll give you. Do you think that? OK, so here's the thing. Do you think the battery gauge is an analog? Like, is it all the way? Is it just a series of like one to 100 pixels high and you fill it up? Or do you think it's like bars? Um, You know what I'm envisioning is you remember the old original version of iOS before they went to the flat design that had the nice green rounded battery? Yeah. Like the nice, the, the horizontal battery that had the nice, it filled up with a nice green rounded gradient looking uh-huh. thing. That's what I've got in my head. See, I, I was know. thinking about, I was thinking about, um, I'm looking for one. I was thinking about one that looks like, uh, like that has like bars that are like 10 different bars along the way. Mm. Hmm. So you can get a percentage idea like, uh, yeah, that, that, okay. That's a good, yeah. I, I started to say, I don't, I feel like bars are not fine grained enough to show your progress, but I guess, I guess being able to see in increments is also useful. Well, here's the thing. You can fill them up from bottom to top, like to show oh. the overall level and you can show, oh. you can go across okay. as you're filling the bars too. So that is thinking like a devious microtransaction, uh, like revenue per user yeah. <laughs> type thing of like progression within progression like you've got your overall battery progression but then each bar is its own meter to fill yeah you milestones can, on, on inside of milestones look once you get good enough and once you charge that battery enough we can sell you a charge accelerator mm. that will increase the amount of charge you can generate per crank you know it's a more a harder okay. harder power but uh more energy we have to stop saying these out loud we can't give these away anymore okay 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 i just emailed it myself we own it now it's ours <laughs> patent pending <laughs> That um, totally works, right? I'm sure that's legally binding. Yeah, why not? That sounds great. Um, I think that's a good place as anything to yeah. wrap it up for the week. This is a fun brainstorming session, at least. Yeah, so uh, if you like this episode, if you didn't like it, please let us know, because uh, mm-hmm. we we do love feedback, and it helps us to know if this is an idea that you all are interested in. Let's, uh, let's thank our patrons, because it's that time yeah. of the show. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, if you would like to find out how to support Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod, which is 100% listener supported, you can go to patreon.com slash tech pod. And for as little as two bucks a month, sign up to support the show, which we really, really appreciate. Um, as always, thank you to our executive producer tier patrons, including Paddle Creek Games, makers of Fractured Veil, vale, Andrew Soloski, Octothorpe Bunny Crimes. The actor who played Wedge is Ewan's uncle, Jacob Chappell, Joel Krauska, the Twinkie Challenge, David Allen, and James Kamek. I wonder what the Twinkie Challenge is. Is that how it's many just, Twinkie? Is that like? Ooh, I don't know. I haven't had chaos. a Twinkie since since uh, since somebody fell in that box of Twinkies in the basement. Oh God! Oh, why did you remind me of that? I ate so many Twinkies when that box was between me and Jeff. It was bad. I, I would just I would just <laughs> look to the left and be like, hey. 
and Jeff would kind of nod at me and then we'd both reach in and grab a Twinkie. Just, just Twinkie me. I, I mean, it was, I, I, I went from never having had a Twinkie to never wanting to see a Twinkie again in my life faster than I thought was possible. I mean, they're really just sugar. There's they're like delicious. Kind of nothing else in there. They're but so sugar. good. It's like Did a you little eat the smushed ones. No, I didn't know. Once Ethan, when, once Ethan's ass went on him, I didn't want any more to do with them. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. No, thank you, sir. Did you? No, nah, I didn't really partake of those Twinkies too much, uh-huh. honestly. Yeah. I, my Twinkie. Look, my capacity for Bojangles is infinite, but, but for Twinkies, pretty limited. Look, if I was eating a little Debbie or a, a snack cake thing, I wanted a star cake. That's where my yeah. money was. Oh, a little rice. Oh, really? Oh, man. Some carob. It's, it's, it's all about the oatmeal cookies or the fudge rounds around here. Oh, I've never, I don't know if I've ever had... It's funny. That was a that was a a variety of snack that my mom explicitly banned from the house. Oh, so, really? <laughs> like, well, not here. So then I can tell you, you were probably better off. We would occasionally get like Oreos or something like that, something really tragically bad for you. But like the the kind of in between, uh, you know, local local bakery type snacks were never around. We would have like occasionally like a batch of chocolate chip cookies or something. But anyway, uh, that'll do it for us this week. Uh, if you oh. I guess we come up with a name later for the game, the battery meter. Oh yeah, that's that's like the last thing. Oh, we need a project name. Let's oh something like a that, code that, name. That's our homework. Our homework is to come up with a good code name. We can do it for the cold open next week. Yes, that sounds good. Okay, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We will see you all next week and have a wonderful week. Bye.